Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll get started in just a couple of moments, letting a few more people uh, join the call. So bear with us, just give it one or two more minutes and let a few more people come in. All right, good day, everyone. We'll get started and we'll let a few more folks uh, filter in. My name is Shauna McMillan and I'm a director on the board at SILTNA, the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transportation here in North America. And I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar. Uh, quickly, for those of you who may be a little bit new to SILTNA, it is an international organization which purposes to raise people's awareness of all aspects of moving both passengers and goods. Um, we provide uh, the best way for up and coming logistics and transportation professionals um, in North America, easy access to experienced executives who are already in the sector, um, make professional development simple and effective with educational seminars like you'll see today with trusted senior level advice. Um, some of our activities range from organizing and hosting meetings, conferences, seminars, and workshops, as you'll see today, um, as well as going as far as accrediting and partnering with ins educational institutions that teach logistics, supply chains, and transportation to upcoming generations of professionals. If you're interested in more information about becoming a member or participating more in these events, please feel free to check us out at our website at siltna.com. And today, like I said, you're in for some excitement. It's not often in the world of supply chain and logistics, you get the opportunity to create a brand new infrastructure connection between two massive trading partners like Canada and the US. Today, we will be delving into the latest news on the Gordie Howe International Bridge from Charles Vanyukirk. Ven Sorry, <laughs> my pronunciation today. He is CEO of the Windsor Detroit Bridge Authority, and our session today is going to be facilitated by our president at Siltna, Mr. Barbara Armstrong. Charles joins us today, having joined the WDBA in July of 2023 as its CEO with a mission to deliver the new Gordie Howe International Bridge. He has a passion for leading teams and delivering projects with a focus on property development, delivering highway, transit, and civil infrastructure. Originally from South Africa with a background in engineering and business administration, he moved to Canada in 2014 and joined Infrastructure Ontario. And as you can tell, he hasn't looked back. We are now in 2024. His first project was to deliver the Right Honourable Herb Gray Parkway in Windsor, and since then has been involved in well over 42 projects worth over $60 billion. So he's well versed in how to make infrastructure work here in Ontario reality. Uh, looking forward to a lively conversation today between our audience and our expert. Uh, we will be able to learn what the next evolution of border crossings will look like and have our opportunity to contribute to what that might look like. So please, everyone today participating, if you have questions, if you have comments, if you want to reach show, please put your questions into the chat box. Uh, Mr. Armstrong will be monitoring the chat box for any questions or comments that come through, and we'll make sure to facilitate that in the Q&A portion of our session today. I also want to thank our sponsor for today, uh, Strengthford Logistics. Unfortunately, Alan is not able to be with us today, uh, but in true logistics and transportation supply chain form, uh, we are backing him up for today's session. So uh, thank you to Strengthford Logistics for the session today. And with that, on behalf of all of us, I would like to welcome Shaw to the webinar. Thank you for being here today and looking forward to the session. Thank you, Shona. You've got great energy, um, so I'm, I'm hoping to match that today. Um, now, the Gordie Howe International Bridge is more than two years in the making. Oh, two decades in the making, two years. <laughs> two decades in the making, and it's an absolute pleasure to talk to Sultna uh, members today about our future vision, um, how this work we are doing can benefit you in future, and then, of course, our progress to achieve it. Now, they say a picture paints a thousand words, so on our next slide, 
um, you will see an image of the Gordian International Bridge taken in December from Detroit looking towards Canada. And you can see the great progress already made um, to complete the bridge. Um, now, today I want to talk to you about, about some of our background, show you what our future facility will look like and what that means for you in the logistics industry, and then tell you a bit more about our current progress and the schedule to complete the bridge. And at the end, we hope to do a bit of a round table because, of course, we look forward to hearing from um, Siltner um, to hear what the members think um, about, of course, our future customers on how we can maximize the benefits for you and for the region as we work towards completing this project. Now, of course, happy to take any questions at the end. Now, we are often asked, why do we need this brand new bridge? There are existing crossings in the Windsor-Detroit corridor. And I think you know the answer um, best of all. Um, US and Canada is, is Canada's largest trading partner with nearly $1 trillion in trade, bilateral trade, between the two countries in 2022. And that has since just increased. And of course, Windsor Detroit Gateway is the busiest commercial land border crossing between Canada and the US, with over 25% of the bilateral trade between the two countries, and of course, over 30% of the overall track, um, truck traffic crossing the border. In addition, over 6,000 workers cross the Windsor Detroit crossing on a daily basis. Now, this data just demonstrates how critical this gateway is to Canada and the US, yet we are all aware of the existing infrastructure constraints in the region that sometimes delay movements across the border. And our vision is to truly create a seamless connection between North America, uh, connecting North America. Now, simply put, we want to remove the existing constraints. And we're hoping to do that by firstly creating redundancy, of course, just by building the new bridge, there's uh, more option in the region of where you can cross. If something happens at one bridge, there's always the opportunity to cross at another bridge. And of course, the redundancy we're building into our facilities so that if something happens, we can still ensure traffic moves smoothly. We're also implementing new facilities and technologies to improve border processing. And we have planned for not only the capacity of today, but the capacity of future. And then finally, with our highway to highway connectivity between the two countries, we hope that traffic can seamlessly um, flow through the region without impacting local roads. Now, the next big, biggest question we always get is, when will this all be finished? Um, we've heard about this bridge for the last 20 years. Now, we uh, announced earlier in January that, of course, everybody knows what happened with COVID and some delays we had. And we're very happy to say that that only delayed us by about 10 months. And we are currently targeting to complete construction in September of next year. And, of course, getting the first vehicles across the bridge um, in fall that year once everything is ready. Now, of course, safety is our top priority, and, and if, if we have to delay somewhat to make sure we get a good quality product and keep everybody safe, so be it. And then if you can move to the next slide. Now, for those of you who do not know yet, um, Windsor Detroit, oh, the, the, the Gordy High International Bridge is located in Windsor Detroit. Um, and uh, when uh, with the Detroit Bridge Authority, WDBA, as we are called, we are a Crown, um, Canadian Crown Corporation charged with actually building, designing, building, operating, and maintaining this facility into the future on behalf of the Canadian government and then in agreement with the U.S. government. And we have subcontracted a lot of our work to Bridging North America, which is a company consisting of Fleur, Dragados, and Acon, who's helping us in a P3 contract form to design, build, operate, and maintain the facility um, over the next 30 years. Now, our facility consists of four major components. Um, on the screen, you can see on the left, we've got the US port of entry that ties into the new Interstate 75 um, interchange that we are currently constructing to create that direct connection from I-75 into the US port of entry. That will lead to the main bridge that you saw in the photo before, which is the longest cable state bridge in North America. And then, of course, on the Canadian side, connecting into the Canadian port of entry, and that will then lead to the Hogue Parkway that was built in 2020, 2015 uh, by the Ontario government. That was one of my very first projects when I moved to Canada. And this, of course, creates that end-to-end highway-to-highway connectivity over the border. So now if we move into uh, the next slide, we'll show you just some of a, a rendering of what this interchange and the future US port of entry will look like in future. And you can see 
the major ramps that you can basically at speed enter the um, US port of entry to directly get um, to the border crossing. Um, on the next slide, you'll see on the Canadian side, um, the completed um, Right Honorable Hergrave Parkway that has been under traffic or open to traffic for the past few years. And there you can see also on the photos how traffic is totally separated, grade separated from all local traffic. So once you get off of the bridge at the at Gordial International Bridge, you can travel right towards the highway with, um, without having to interact with any local traffic at all. Uh, just straight onto the highway and straight through to your destination. Now moving on to our main bridge, um, this is what it will look like in the end. It's, as I said, this is the longest stable um, cable state bridge in North America. Um, our towers are currently complete at 722 feet high or 220 meters. And what you'll see at our cross section here, we really focus on how do we maximize the movement of traffic over the bridge while having the ability to manage any incidents that might occur. Think of a, a truck breaking down on the bridge, impacting traffic, et cetera. So firstly, we will have a barrier separated multi-use path for pedestrians and cycles. And of course, pedestrians and cycles will cross the, the crossing for free in future. We will have three traffic lanes um, and a full width emergency lane in each direction. So for a total of eight lanes where the emergency lane can be used to remove traffic from um, the active lanes or to get emergency vehicles to an incident on the bridge. And each of our lanes is 3.75 meters wide um, to provide that ability to very seamlessly move commercial traffic over the bridge. Of course, we can also accommodate oversized vehicles and hazardous materials, and we will provide more details on, on that over the next few months. Now, moving along to the US Board of Entry, so here you'll see a rendering of what that facility will look like in future. And the first statement I want to make is just we will have on-site certain agencies represented. Um, CBP, USDA, Fish and Wildlife, FDA will all have a permanent presence on-site, each of their own facilities um, that they can use to help more swiftly process um, commercial traffic crossing the border. Um, just walking through the facilities, if I start, start closer to the bridge at the top left, or top right, sorry, you'll see that our main focus is really to separate commercial traffic from non-commercial traffic. So on the one side, you'll see there is 15 primary inspection lanes for commercial traffic. On the other side, you'll see there's 21 primary inspection lanes for non-commercial traffic. And of course, we have the ability to, to convert some of these lanes if needed, if traffic volumes are high. On the non-commercial side, we have 41 secondary inspection bays and of course, dedicated facilities to process buses um, and high volume pedestrians moving through. Uh, we also have um, on the commercial side, um, you'll see we've got 28 secondary inspection bays within our commercial building. So this is all enclosed where you can back up your truck and your trailer onto the building. It's, it's fully air conditioned to allow for that secondary inspection. And we've got in that facility two bays that can take the entire truck, not just the trailer backing up onto the building. Of course, lots of parking for commercial traffic while they wait for processing. We also have on both sides advanced large scale imaging. The intent there is to really reduce the need for secondary inspections, physical inspections, where the truck can just go into large image, um, imaging and um, to scan the entire truck and hopefully thereby um, speeding up processing. You'll also see we have a dedicated USDA building, and part of that is also seven flexible animal pens. So depending on if you want to bring livestock through, we've got facilities to handle all of that. Um, and then we've got separate processing station for our, for our multi-use path for pedestrians and cyclists. That's totally separated from our vehicle traffic. So that keeps pedestrians and cyclists safe while ensuring that processing vehicles, um, cyclists and pedestrians don't hold up any of the other commercial traffic trying to cross the crossing. You'll also see at the bottom right here um, of the main image, outbound inspection. So that is uh, vehicles coming from the US um, into Canada. You can, have, you can have some initial inspection processing going through. Now, as part of our expedited processing, we will of course accept Nexus cards, uh, free and secure trade, and the um, trusted traveler and trusted trader programs, each with dedicated lanes to get through the crossing. At both our ports of entries, we've got some limited cold storage. Um, as I mentioned, animal pens, warehouse parking, et cetera. 
So we really went out of our way to make sure we can provide the facilities our, our future customer needs. And we, of course, want to hear more from you to see how we can en enhance that um, those services. Now, looking at the Canadian side, Canadian side is slightly smaller, but we are also providing the same features. So if you look at, uh, we've got 12 primary inspection bays purely dedicated to commercial traffic. Same on the non-commercial side. Some of those non-commercial lanes can be converted to um, commercial traffic. So those inspection booths has got by levels so that the inspector in the booth can um, work with the trucks at the higher level or the smaller vehicles. Again, dedicated um, bus lanes. And you can see on the layout that we have totally separated commercial and non-commercial traffic just for safety and efficiency of the, of the area. Um, top right of the main image, you can see there are hazardous material inspection. So it's totally um, separated from the rest of the facility. Again, we've got an advanced large scale imaging uh, facility on the Canadian side as well. Um, and then on the commercial side, here we've got a similar commercial building as we have on the US side. In this case, we can handle 14 secondary, we have 14 secondary bays and then 37 parking spaces for transport trucks in the open area. So 14 uh, vehicles can be processed at the same time in this enclosed facility. Um, you'll see also on the bottom um, right, again, we've got a separate pedestrian and cyclist processing facility for our multi-use pass, again, for safety, and just making sure we, we improve the processing for commercial folks. And then our uh, maintenance building. Next to the maintenance building, you can see there's some landscaping there. That's in future where we plan to do our um, duty-free uh, area. We're still planning that work, and we'll, we'll communicate more to our customers in the, in the upcoming years. Again, on site here on the Canadian side, we've got CFIA and, of course, um, Canadian Border Services. Moving on to our next slide. Um, of course, state-of-the-art intelligence transportation systems, or ITS. And now what this means is that we have direct connection into MDOT and MTO to share information about traffic, queue lengths, um, changing road conditions, et cetera. And of course, that information can then be provided to our customers through multiple variable messaging, et cetera. On site, we also have a dedicated 24 seven traffic management center. And this is to help us respond very quickly to any um, issues or emergencies we have on site. We'll do security monitoring from there, our bridge monitoring to make sure our assets remain safe and usable, um, architectural lighting control, et cetera. Um, and from this control center, you can really see anywhere on our facility. We have over 50 CCTV cameras, which will provide us with 100% coverage over the entire facility to make sure we can very quickly respond to any incident on site. We also have various sensors built into our pavement, so we can do automatic traffic detection, classification of vehicles, as I said, monitoring queue lengths so that if the queue lengths become too big, we can take action, um, change lanes around, and, and just streamline the processing. Of course, I hope you all understand that once we open, um, this is going to be a learning curve for all of us, um, us getting to know our facility and improving um, operations, and of course, our customers to get to know our facility. So we expect some teething problems over those first few months, but we look forward to working with you to, to resolve all of those different issues. Now, this is where we need your help. Um, so on the next slide, we are currently undertaking a traffic and revenue study. Now, on this slide, you'll see some data from 2013 that just shows various trips over the border, um, Windsor-Detroit border. Um, it's an origin destination study that shows the hotspots of where uh, various traffic um, comes from. And it's, we will be very interested to see what, how that has changed over the past few years, especially with the impacts of COVID, et cetera. Now, as you can see from that imagery, and I'm sure you will know more than we do if, um, from the logistics side of point, Point of view, most of our traffic comes from the Midwest and southern parts of the U.S., traveling, of course, up into to Ontario and then the rest of Canada. So if you have any input in terms of who we should um, focus on, please reach out. And I've provided an e email address here in case you want to reach out and get to, onto our mailing list. We are very interested to understand who's our customers, where our customers are coming from, and especially as we start sculpting our um, tolling policy, which, of course, uh, we'll discuss on the next slide. So just to note, we do not currently know what our tolling rates are going to be. We are busy finalizing our policy, working with our customer base to understand 
um, the impacts of tolling and we'll um, announce the tolling rates um, to the end of this year or, or um, closer to the beginning of next year. What we can say, we are focusing on a rate based on axles of the vehicle and so vehicle classification. Um, we have eight um, turning lanes inwards and outbound, outbound and inbound, just to make sure um, that's not the bottleneck in the process, so you can get through there swiftly. Of course, tolls will be payable in both Canadian and US dollars, and we'll accept a combination of manual, automatic, and electronic toll collection. Our focus is really um, the electronic toll collection, and we'll work with you to make sure as many as possible of the vehicles is tagged um, um, to get through our facility. We are also currently working with various service provider on interoperability, so that if you already have a tag, um, on one of these service providers, you'll be able to cross through our bridge and we'll definitely share more information about that um, in the coming months. Of course, we'll also have a full-time customer service call center on site, um, offering bilingual service in both French and English. Um, some of the considerations we're still discussing internally is things like time of day tolling, um, as I mentioned, tolling on interoperability. Um, and then, of course, what our website interface will look like, potential apps, et cetera, loyalty programs, discount programs. And this is really where we want to hear from our customer base. So if you want to get involved in those discussions, please reach out and, and get yourself added to our mailing list, and we'll be happy to talk to you. So I think that, in a nutshell, just gives you a brief overview of what our facility will look like in future. Um, I thought it would be nice to show you some of our construction progress. Um, as I said, we are at the peak of construction at the moment. Uh, targeting to get construction completed by September next year. On the screen, you can see some images that were taken you know, between December and January. Uh, here you can see on the left-hand side, the bridge uh, from the Canadian side. Now our bridge span is about two thirds complete already. And we expect that the bridge deck itself will connect at the middle of this year. Um, so it's very nice to see the progress if you live in the area of the construction at the moment. Um, it will look like for about a year that everything is standing still while we do finishing inside of buildings. Currently, you can see the buildings being built. Most of our buildings are complete. The bridge will be complete by the middle of this year, the deck at least. And then the team will work on installing the various ITS systems, final surfacing, line painting, street furniture, etc. So it might seem that it's slowing down, but believe me, the team will be working full speed until we open in September next year. Now, interesting to note that this is the longest cable state bridge in North America. And even though the bridge is not complete yet, it's already the longest. So if you just take the pieces of the deck that's already complete, that's already longer than the second longest cable state bridge in North America uh, with a span of 853 meters. Um, this is more from an environmental consideration. We wanted to make sure that our bridge structure is totally outside of the water uh, waterway. Um, you would have seen in one of the previous slides I mentioned, um, our tower is complete, um, over 722 feet tall. So if you know the Detroit area and the gym buildings, our bridge tower is basically the same height as the gym buildings. Next slide, you can see uh, how work's progressing at our ports of entry on the left top hand side. Um, that's the US side. You can see all the buildings are complete, canopies are com nearly complete. We, we're busy in, installing all the surfacing treatments and then, of course, uh, fitting out all the buildings and completing the buildings internally with the various systems we need. On the right hand side, you can see a view from the Canadian port of entry. Um, that archway is the, the big canopy for primary inspection, so 12 lanes in and out, and then leading, um, and you can see the bridge um, crossing to the US side. And then finally, some imagery of uh, the I-75 interchange. So the work there is progressing very well. Um, most of the local bridges are already complete and we're busy finalizing the, the ramps into our site from I-75. Of course, if you wanna see more image, uh, images, um, please go look at our website and uh, our social media where we share images monthly of the great work we're doing now. A few interesting statistics. We've already logged over 12 million work hours on site. It's phenomenal um, the progress the team has made. Um, in the last year, one, our peak month was logging over 450,000 men um, work hours logged for that month. Of course, 42% of our, our workers are local, and we've engaged over 275 um, local businesses to help support construction of our project. 
Finally, just some contact information. Like I said, uh, a lot of images and videos available, so please join our social media. Our email address is there if you want to join our mailing list or just get in contact and talk to us. We're very happy to hear from you and see how we can serve you, our customers, um, better in future. So, Shona, that's the wrap-up for what we wanted to present. Um, looking forward to any questions there might be. That's wonderful, Charles. Thank you very much for the context and, and where we stand. It has been a couple of decades in the making. So I'm going to hand it over to Bob, who's going to facilitate all the Q&A from, from our, uh, our chat group and from our participants. And I'm sure he's also got a few that he wanted to plant as well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Charles. I thought that was a great presentation, uh, very, uh, some great information. You know, I, uh, many of our uh, Siltna members are really looking forward to see the Gordie Howe uh, Bridge in operation in September of 2025. I know that the opening date has slipped a bit. Uh, how difficult it must have been for uh, to continue con construction during COVID, for example. But what did the WDBA and your Bridging North America partners do to keep the timetable going as much as possible or the kind of challenges and things you had to, had to do? You know, um, as I said, I've worked on 42 major transit projects in Ontario and I was really impressed um, with the dedication of this team. And I, I would firstly thank the dedication of our workers who was willing to work through this trying time. Now, if you think of impacts of COVID, um, you must consider that our bridge team was not only struggling with uh, COVID regulations from one country, but actually from two countries, seeing that we have to comply mm -hmm. with the regulations from both countries, some of them confusing, some of them contradicting. So I think our contractor really did a, a great job to keep um, our workers motivated to make sure we can press, um, proceed with construction through that trying time. And happy to say, due to all the dedication and, and shifting around some of the sequencing, managed to limit the impacts to only 10 months, actually less than 10 months, it's about nine and a half months. So I'm very happy with what the team and the contractor was able to achieve then, just pushing this work forward. That's great. Thank you. Um, one of the things uh, I wanted to talk about uh, before I open uh, to the Q&A, um, Sean and I were both members of Transport Canada's supply ch National Supply Chain Task Force. And we heard recurring themes about red tape, including the administration of border regulations. But the big one was that we heard a lot was the concern that uh, shippers and, 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 and truckers had with the service level and the staffing levels of uh, CBSA and uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Uh, so that, that's, that's a concern they have. Will you have the staffing that you, that, that you need 24-7 on both sides of the bridge, uh, especially given that in September 2025, the other bridge will still be in operation. So, you know, the industry's fear is, uh, are both governments prepared to put the resources in to the Gordy Howe to make sure it can handle the business that is going to come? Yeah, of course, I can speak on behalf of these agencies. I can just give you our perspective from working with these agencies. Um, we can really see the commitment there. Um, we know that on the US side, the US uh, board agency is actually treating their new facility as their training facility to train um, border personnel for the entire border. So they'll be focused there, training people there. So um, we are confident they will have people. Same on the Canadian side, we know that CBSA is currently training over 200 new personnel um, to be put into the, the system to help with this. Uh, you mentioned the existing crossing. We see that as a feature. It's, it's fantastic that we have multiple crossings in the area. For us, it is connectivity through the region. And of course, having that um, secondary bridge or two bridges uh, in the same corridor is great just for everybody. Just in case something happens at one bridge, um, we still have a crossing open. That, so yes, all indications are that the, the dedication is there. Um, I think everybody acknowledges the criticality of this work. The governments are spending a lot of money on this infrastructure. And um, we're already in talks, CBSA is ready and, and GSA is really hard at work fitting out or, or getting ready to fit out their facilities and getting their staff ready. Well, that's great because I, you know, I, my, my own personal thing is I, I, I think uh, the new bridge is so exciting. The facilities are going to be all brand new. If I was a, uh, a customs officer or an immigration officer on either side of the border, I think I'd be happy to be in the new facility uh, that's, that's expanded and has a lot 
lot mm -hmm. going for it. So that's that's very good news. Uh, Charles, that's that's important to the industry is serve the, the level of service they would get from these government uh, uh, departments. Um, the other the other uh, thing I just wanted to say um, before I go to uh, 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 into the the chat box was really to 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 talk about um, the Gordy Howe Bridge, as we can see from your presentation, is a state of the art facility probably the best in the world. I mean, it's going to have everything. So the real challenge that faces logistics and transportation businesses today is how do they stay abreast of the rapid changes in technology and how will the WDBA be playing a role in the future once the bridge is built? So, of course, our vision is totally to have that seamless connection. It's not for us just about managing the build or building the bridge and managing the bridge is really to see how we can make it easier for our customers. So that's just a lot of customer engagement, working with the industries to to firstly understand what is the best technology out there and how we can implement in our system. How can we work with everybody um, to improve processes on site? Like I said, I expect some teething problems the first few months, but hopefully we get good feedback from our customers to see how we can smooth those out. A lot of education we're hoping to do. Um, so the plan is to, before we even open, is to share a lot more information on the exact facility so people can start getting to know the facility virtually before uh, we actually open. Um, and then, yeah, just working with, with you and the rest of, uh, rest of our customers to improve that. Well, I, I congratulate you and the WDBA. I think it's really important and, and wonderful that you want to understand the customer needs and the priorities for the future, uh, you know, and here we are, uh, you know, over a year ahead of time, but that's good because that gives us all lots of time, both you and us, uh, to make sure we get this information back to you so that you can better understand what the needs are. And what I'll commit to from Silton is that we have a weekly uh, a newsletter and Heather's given me some uh, various uh, uh questions and information that the that the WDBA would like to gather. We'll put some questions in every week and get those replies back mm -hmm. to you. I think that's a good way of, of doing it. I, I really applaud you for that because that's the, the openness is really, really important because I think communication and, and for the industry to step up and say, hey, here's some of our concerns and will you be able to do this? I think it is very, very important for you to be prepared and for the industry to see the the true benefit uh, of crossing the bridge because I know I worked with uh, on a contract uh, I guess about five years ago with the cross border institute at the University of Windsor we did a economic study yes. about the Gordie Howe International Bridge so I interviewed shippers on both sides of the border and trucking mm -hmm. companies and they were really excited about it. the excitement was there. Yes, yes five and seven years ago, and maybe it might have waned a bit totally because of time. But I think you'll see as we do more of these types of talks with the industry, it'll come back. So we want to help you wherever we can. So let me go to a, a chat box for a moment. The seamless integration with highways is great, but I'm curious if there will be the ability to integrate the facilities with the possible resumption of passenger rail service? So we are currently actually in talk with um, all the different agencies. So I've got a, a quarterly discussion with our, the Windsor Ports Authority, Airports Authority, um, ongoing discussions with VIA and other rail entities to see how we can enhance that integration. So for example, there's a direct route from the uh, Ports Authority facilities to our bridge. Um, rail route is a bit more difficult. It's on the other side of Windsor, but um, there is definitely direct connections to get there. So we are definitely, that's something we are looking at for that integration. Our focus, of course, is more the commercial traffic. Um, Non-commercial traffic in Windsor, Detroit, you've got still the Ambassador Bridge, you've got the tunnel, so there's a lot of opportunity there. Our focus is really to, to focus on the commercial traffic that really bypasses Detroit, Windsor, um, you know, between the Canada and US. Very good. Thank you. Next question. Any issues with the owners of the Ambassador Bridge as they were very litigious for several years trying to prevent having the new bridge built? There will always be, uh, I, I suppose, concerns. Um, from a private sector perspective, we are a competitor for tolling um, and for customers. 
you know, from our perspective, this is all about the region and how we can maximize traffic flow through the region. So we see it as a benefit for having Ambassador Bridge there. Um, ultimately, the customers will have to make their choice and, and where traffic flows best. But we see it as a great feature to have multiple crossings um, in the area. Great. Ah, next one. The new Gordie Howe Bridge was conceived at least partly to reduce the congestion on the Ambassador Bridge, and it certainly will. Do we know of other locations along arteries in the new bridge's nearby catchment area that might become new bottlenecks? And what would that mean for the bridge authorities about dealing with them? So, of course, we are talking here about the highway to highway connectivity. And you'll see that um, if you look at Ontario, government has already taken a lot of um, steps to maintain or manage some of these bottlenecks. So one of the bottlenecks is getting to the 401 and Highway 3 on the Canadian side. As I said, Hope Great Parkway was already built in 2015 to, to totally resolve the bottleneck across the route. Um, I know Infrastructure Ontario currently has a new contract out to upgrade Highway 3. It also connects to the same area. And then, of course, the U.S. has got similar programs. Now, if you look at our catchment area, it's really our bridge, um, Ambassador Bridge, and then Blue Water, uh, which is a further out. It's a sister agency of ours, and we work very closely with them to also manage traffic across the corridor. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Will the bridge be anticipating an equal number of commercial and non-commercial traffic, hence informing the decision to go with 11 paths for each, or was this decision made based on the design of similar facilities? So I would say in North America, they aren't really similar facilities. This is the largest land-based crossing in uh, between Canada and the US. The only bigger one is between US and Mexico. Now, a few years ago when the project started, everything was based on traffic patterns at that stage. And that's why um, the, how the number of uh, lanes were selected. And that was, of course, mostly through research of our agencies. So we worked very closely with our border agencies to determine the exact facilities, number of lanes, et cetera. Now, as I said, the, the, the only thing you know about traffic studies is that they're typically wrong. You can never really <laughs> forecast traffic. So what we focus more on is flexibility. So even though we've got on the Canadian side a um, specific number of lanes assigned to non-commercial commercial vehicles, we do have the ability to change some of those. So if commercial vehicle becomes heavy, we can just divert them to the non-commercial um, lanes and they can still be serviced there and then go to secondary inspection if needed. Oh. So we, we focus a lot of, on, on future-proofing the facility as much as possible um, Excellent. in our design. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, next one. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Do you have a sense about whether this new border capacity will create new industry logistics models or whether we are likely to see the existing models scale up using established patterns? So I think it's a bit of both. Um, we've already had indication that there's a lot of development happening, um, especially in the Windsor Detroit region. Look at the battery plants. I know Amazon is building a new warehouse there. So because of the certainty a lot of developers are getting on the ability to cross there, um, I think that will just that the bridge will become a, a catalyst for economic growth. And, and that is part of what we're trying to do is just to spread the message of the future facility so that investors can plan their um, future investments around the fact that we will have this new crossing. So definitely believe that, I mean, that was the main person, uh, one of the main reasons um, our bridge is being built is for economic development. So that's one of our big focuses. Thank you. Will the WDBA allow for multiple towing recovery providers to service breakdowns on the bridge? The current model at the existing bridge limits the services to a single service provider at exorbitant charges. Great question. I don't yeah. know the answer to that. So that is a, a great example of feedback we want from the industry. And then we can take that back and see how we manage that. So um, there are some things already contracted to our partners bridging North America, but we also still have some um, some opportunity to change things. Uh, might not be able to implement all the requests um, immediately on opening, but that's something we can look at for the long term. It's a great question. We'll get back to you on that one. Thank you. Uh, do we know if there's this is similar to, to the previous two questions ago, but do we know if there's been any redesign of logistics systems as a result of the new bridge? 
such as moving or changing the size of warehousing and other facilities upstream or downstream of the new bridge in, in anticipation of what it will enable. So I think I'm the wrong person to ask there. <laughs> I'm the infrastructure guy. This is more a question for Siltner, but happy to work with the team to answer that. Um, I mean, the only thing we can do is really share the information about the bridge to the different logistics um, entities um, and supply chains, and then see how we can work with you to to optimize your operations. I do know, Charles, when we did the economic study, mind you, it's a long time ago, but at the same time, I did speak to a lot of companies who were very, very interested in in um, establishing facilities uh, uh, on either side of the bridge adjacent to the plazas as close as they could. Uh, to handle distribution. Uh, so I still think that that's probably going to happen. I think some companies are merely waiting for it, the bridge to actually open. Mm -hmm. But I think the economic uh, uh, viability of the Gordie Howe International Bridge is, is great for the industry. And I, I really think that in particular, Essex County will, you know, will benefit from it. No, absolutely. And I mean, one of the questions to the Siltner members is, as we start planning the other facilities on our ports of entries, you'll see it's a big piece of land. We've got some yep. open areas. We're still thinking about duty-free facilities, et cetera. What other facilities might the industry want close to or at the bridge that we might be able to work together to get those facilities? You know, offices for brokerages or whatever the case might be. Yep. Um, so that will be good to get that feedback from Sultan as well. Yeah, and we'll get that for you because I'm interested because you know because we we did that study either I don't know some time between five and seven years ago and a lot has changed. Of course, COVID came and mm -hmm. and went, but the world the supply chain is constantly changing. There's more reshoring now. You know, if you looked at at the area now, uh, the whole idea of EV vehicles and the battery factories. Uh, facilities that are being built in in Windsor and southwestern Ontario, they're going to have a bearing on a lot of things too. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes. But we'll continue to gather more and more of that information. Here's our next question. You have mentioned collaboration with the border service agencies. What steps are underway to reduce red tape and regulatory burdens at the border crossing? Can the Gordie Howe be a site to test streamlining border crossings? Absolutely, yes. So we are very close contact with agencies. You will see a lot of the design of our facilities is to do exactly that. So both agencies got, uh, I think, put, got to put down their wish list of what they would want to see at the ultimate facility. And 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 I can say that we really went uh, a long way to, to include that. Um, I also know that both agencies are very eager to test new technologies there. I know that the Sorry, Heather, you're going to have to help me what, what it was called, the remote, where you don't have it to have an agent actually at the at the booth. So it's all through camera. That won't be available on day one, but I know that um, they are planning to test it at our at our bridge where um, you can basically just get scanned through, et cetera. Um, so definitely, I think, as I said, the US side is, is planning to use our facility as their training facility. So of course, the latest in the US will always, they always try and, and try it there and, and new processes and, and continuously improve there. Big focus for us to try and get traffic volumes through and, and, and lower um, travel time through the ports. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Well, here's one. How do you, how have, how, oh, have you factored in climate change and how and potential adverse weather events in the future, such as high winds in the bridge, frequent freezing rains and the like? So maybe this is a climate change kind of question. So absolutely, and that's one of the reasons this is the longest cable state bridge in, a, in, in North America and one of the tallest. And you'll see also it has a very slim profile. Now, our bridge itself was designed for 125-year life, and uh, we had a huge focus on environmental protection and climate change. So that's why, for example, the span is so long, so that we can keep the structure outside of the, the floodway and outside of the river itself. Mm -hmm. Um, you'll also see on our imagery and when you get to site, uh, big detention ponds to help manage and, and um, stormwater. Um, our facilities is also um, designed to handle high winds. Um, icing of the, of the bridge is an is a interesting one. There's no real clear technology in the world at the moment to deal with ice on cables, etc. cetera. Um, so that's something we'll, we'll continue to look at. Um, but yes, overall, yes, definitely. The, the design is all focused on, on long-term 
capacity and environmental protection and climate change. Interesting. What provisions are being made for agricultural products such as fruits and vegetables? Good question. Um, so definitely you'll see the facilities is, is, uh, is geared towards doing secondary inspections inside enclosed building. We've had some discussion where people talk about refrigeration and I think that's maybe an area where we can do some more. Now currently at our Canadian side, we've got a, a refrigeration room um, that you can unpack equipment into or, or produce into while it's been inspected if needed. Keeping in mind that the first line of defense is the, the scanner so that you actually have avoid the need to having your your truck open and maybe impacting your fresh produce in the back. But on the Canadian side, we do have some limited cold storage uh, facilities. It's one area we might investigate to increase that after discussion with some of our fruit and veg um, producers. And on the US side, a big industrial, uh, call it chest freezers. I don't know if that's gonna be enough, I, I, but that's something we are working with, wanna work with the industry and understand the need better. Oh, thank you. Um, Here's a good question. Uh, um, you know, if you're a trucking company, you're always interested in how quick you're going to get across the bridge. Are there end to end time targets for commercial crossings? If so, how do the tar your targets compare to the current average times? Great question. We definitely will have targets. Um, I think a lot of it will depend on how quickly our customers get to our facilities to move through the facility. And then of course our operations team to ramp up. You always have a teething period the first few months. We already have plans in place to not only be able to, to track and monitor the movement of vehicles through the facility, queue length, all kinds of other elements. Um, but then to, from then on, manage our performance to drive those that's done. It's already defined as one of our key indicators. We don't know what that time is yet. All we have is theoretical models, but um, all we know about theoretical models, they're typically wrong once it hits real life. So the idea is once we open, start monitoring that, see how we can improve it, and then our focus is to improve that. We are very confident that the, the crossing times will be much shorter than existing crossing times, just by the fact that you've got highway to high, highway connectivity, you can avoid local roads. Um, much bigger capacity to process vehicles, much quicker. All the facilities on one side, you don't have to drive to you know different locations for secondary in inspection, etc. So we know that just by the facilities we're providing, we'll definitely have uh, higher throughput than existing crossings. Don't know what the exact minutes are. But we'll... <laughs> well, thank you. Um, here's another one. There is considerable no person's land between the two port of entries. What provisions are necessary to prevent persons or small packages, et cetera, from dropping down on land beneath the bridge before reaching the opposite port, port of entry? Thank you very much. What a great presentation and a great project. So I'm hoping I'm understanding the question correctly. Now, firstly, um, our POEs were set back from the river somewhat, of course, both from the fact that there are other users in the area, but also from an environmental protection as well. Um, the agencies are focused very heavily on security. The other question we always typically get is, I mean, the, the bridge deck is actually hollow. You can actually walk through the whole thing. How will that be secured? Can people smuggle stuff through there or packages drop off? Um, so a lot of camera coverage. Um, the area is very well secured um, to manage um, goods coming in and out of the area. Um, so not very concerned about that. Um, Don't know if I fully understand the question correctly. I guess I, I think they're just looking to see if you can, you know, how do you prevent people from underneath the bridge or something, moving something across? Yeah, I mean, if you actually go to the bridge and see how high the bridge deck is relative to ground level, I mean, even if you're oh. under the bridge, there's no way of getting anything on top of the bridge. You really have to come up the ramps. Um, it, it's very high. Um, yeah. So we are currently looking at actually more what we use that land for. The focus currently is environmental protection and creating more um, environmental sound areas, especially around the ports of entry. And then of course, some space will be used for, like we said, uh, duty-free, maybe some other facilities that enhances the customer experience. Okay. Um, has EV charging been included in your infrastructure plans? Yes. So currently we've got uh, EV charging stations planned for our agencies and of course for WDB and, B, uh, and BNA. Um, in future, and this is part of the discussion on, on the additional land we have, um, 
uh, we may provide um, some EV charging stations for the public where they can charge. That's something we are currently looking at, um, but for our own operations, yes, our plan is to go move more toward hybrid or EV vehicles in future. Thank you. Are there designs and changes in logistics processes with the Gordy Howe Bridge that will increase the CBSA service standard for processing commercial trucking compared to what happens at the current Ambassador Bridge? Absolutely. If you just look at the new design of the facility, the technology being implemented, this is really a state-of-the-art facility. It's a huge facility. I mean, um, you'll, you'll see when you get there just the number of booths we have, the number of facilities, um, the walking paths for, for agents to get to the different booths. Everything was considered to maximize and optimize operations in the area. Everything from training centers on site, all facilities very closely located together. Um, so it's all, all designed to optimize their efficiency in terms of processing vehicles. Thank you, because that's a great answer. That's, that's, <laughs> that, that, that question really kind of is a big one for the industry, and mm -hmm. you answered it very, very well. Thank you. Uh, here's another one. Oh, <laughs> this is a, a cute one. Are you recruiting yet for the bridge operation? If not, <laughs> when will you be recruiting? Yes. <laughs> So we are busy ramping up our operations side. We just recently appointed our own chief operations officer and VP bridge operations. Um, but of course, we over, oversee the work Bridging North America is doing. Now, Bridging North America is the ones who will actually do the operations and maintenance on site. We oversee them and manage everything strategically. Uh, we do know that they are busy ramping up their um, uh, uh, roles and their, and their operations team. Of course, they also need to be operations ready. Um, us, like them, is also trying to look at what existing staff we can use for those roles, but definitely there will be roles coming out for the from ex, for external recruitment over the next few months as the post teams ramp up. Uh, here's uh, probably going to be our last question. How can industry participants follow up with suggestions or questions? Can you provide a link? And I think, Heather, that would be that last slide. Absolutely. So we will share the deck with you. All our contact information is on there, all our social media. I think the best way is to um, just use our email address and, and get on our mailing list. Um, and there should be a link, I think, Heather, also where industry can and connect. So yes, just get on our mailing list. We'll make sure you stay informed. Yeah, that's that's good um, and very, very important, Charles. And just so you know, there's we always get a lot of uh, uh, people signed up we very very varied audience for our webinar today well uh well over 110 people they're obviously all didn't show up today but they always want uh what they do is they always want the video so we'll be sending it to them along with your slides uh they always want to see that so that's important and that we want to make sure that you get the answers you need and that's what we'll commit to with with uh heather and i've been talking with some of the other uh issues that you'd like to hear more about and experiences. And I have to apologize, I had a trucking company friend of mine who was gonna tell you all about uh, the trials and tribulations of crossing the current bridge uh, and, and issues and information like that. And unfortunately got called away to an emergency and couldn't make it this morning. So I apologize, but we'll have to do that one another time, Heather. Um, but we will take uh, 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 make sure that you you get feedback from us. We we will use our newsletter and other forms, our social media campaigns that we do on a regular basis. Uh, but Charles, I wanted to thank you very very much for taking the time today. I think it's it's so important uh, for the industry uh, to hear about the the developments of the Gordy Howe International Bridge. It's an exciting time uh, for everybody. Uh, you know, we've been waiting for this for a long time, and I think uh, you're going to see the feedback you need that you and Heather want to get. We're we're going to do everything we can to help you with that. Maybe we could set up another roundtable with a couple other organizations like the OTA and, and the FMA and some other organizations where it could be maybe a smaller roundtable. One of my ideas, well, it might be a smaller roundtable, but where the people have specific questions and feedback they could give you. Something just a little more, but we'll keep helping wherever, ever we can. Uh, and we congratulate you on the progress. And by the way, Charles, for your own experience, the Herb Gray uh, Parkway is just a tremendously well done uh, connect to connect the bridge. I think that to the 401, I think that was a great job that you led there. 
and with your experiences there are obviously going to uh, help make the Gordie Howe uh, bridge the, the best uh, border crossing in the world. Oh, so, thank you very much. It was an absolute pleasure. I mean, you represent our future customers, which is our focus. I'm so very eager to hear from you. We might not be able to respond to everything and give everything the industry wants, but we'll do our best. Well, thank you very, very much to you and Heather. Have a great day. Uh, and again, I just want to thank our sponsor, Alan Cook at, at Strange Ford uh, Consulting, who apologizes he had to go away on a client emergency in Prince Edward Island, so he wasn't able to to be here with us today. But again, I hope you, Charles, that you and Heather have a great day, and I hope that we can continue to provide the feedback you need uh, in the future. And, Absolutely. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, and congratulations. Thanks. All the very best. Thank you, everybody. Bye now.